Uh, it, it is essential. It is our most important adult work to free ourselves from the limiting beliefs that we have formed in our past. We want to be good. We want to feel we are decent human beings. We want others to think we're decent human beings, but we're actually afraid that that's not true. That if we were to fully show up and be exposed who we really are, then there would be inadequacies, there would be shortcomings, there would be um, deficiencies with our character. So we want to be good, but we're actually afraid that we're bad. If you can't prevent your children from establishing limiting beliefs, then your sole role is to model to them what it looks like to overcome them when the time is right, <laughs> to show them that you don't have to get stuck in a story, that you can change, you can update, you can reinvent, you can heal, uh, you can go back and reinterpret the past and set yourself free. Well, welcome everyone to the Revolutionary Man podcast. I'm the founder of The Awakened Man and your host, Alan DeMonso. You know, I don't know anyone who has not encountered a moment of insecurity, do you? Now think about that first. The first time you saw your wife, did you feel confident or were you a little insecure? No, you got that one? Okay, how about going for that huge goal in your life, like starting your own business or quitting a job to start a life's passion? The point is we're all, we all have moments of doubt, fear, and uncertainty, and that's natural. But what if these moments become the saboteur of everything that you ever dreamed of and wanted? Well, today my guest is going to share his story of how he overcame insecurity in changing his in the lives of himself and the countless of other people around the world. Now, before I want to get into all that, I want to remind you to hit like, subscribe, and share on your favorite platform so you can stay updated on our latest content, as well as helping me grow the Awakened Man message. And for that, I just want to say I'm truly grateful. So with everything being said, let's get on with today's episode. The average man today is sleepwalking through life, many never reaching their true potential let alone ever crossing the finish line to living a purposeful life. Yet, the hunger still exists, albeit buried amidst his cluttered mind, misguided beliefs, and values that no longer serve him. It's time to align yourself for greatness. It's time to become a revolutionary man. Stay strong, my brother. As you know, it's customary I like to start off by asking a couple of questions just to get us to set the stage for today's discussion. So when was the last time that you felt insecure? And has that insecurity been a familiar one for you? You know, having insecurities is natural, is natural and how we deal with it can determine how successful we are in achieving our life's mission, no matter how big or small, or whether you think it's profound enough or not. But being able to flip that script on our insecurity is a skill that everyone should learn. So allow me to introduce my guest. Jamin Fraser is a TEDx speaker, a world-class coach, and the founder of the Insecurity Project, specializing in helping entrepreneurs, leaders, and business owners eradicate insecurity so they can show up to life unhindered by doubt, fear, and self-limiting beliefs. He's widely recognized as one of Australia's best life coaches and a leading voice globally on personal insecurity. James is also the author of several books, including Unhindered, The Seven Essential Practices of Overcoming Insecurity, and his one-minute coach radio segment, is heard by over 750,000 listeners a day. Welcome to the show, Jamin. How are things today? Alan, thanks for having me. Yeah, great to be here. Yeah, so grateful to have you here. I really, really liked your topic and I'm really looking forward to diving into it. But before we get right into the into that part of it, I, I always have an opening question for my guests. And what we want to ask you about is your hero's quest. And we talk about in my men's work about all of us being on a hero's quest. It's that part of our life, the different experience that helped shape who we are today. So tell us about your journey and how that paved the road to who you are and the work you're doing. Hmm. Yeah, thanks, Alan. Great, great question. I love the hero's journey uh, and, and the quest that I'm on. Uh, it's, it's had many iterations over the years. Uh, at, at the moment, the, the biggest dream and quest for my life is to influence the key decision makers in the world, the policy makers, the lawmakers, captains of industry, the, the leaders of the free world. I think that insecurity is a global issue. And I think our world leaders are some of the most insecure people alive. And we suffer greatly because of their leadership influence from their ego, from their defend and prove attitude. And so um, my quest is to 
uh, to solve the insecurity problem at that level with those kind of people uh, for the sake of the future of the planet. And, and that there are times where that quest has daunted me. Mm. Um, and there are times where uh, for me to really understand that I, I've understood that it, it's bigger than me and not even about me. So the sense of surrender into that and the sense of uh, it would be unkind and inappropriate not to be wholehearted about the pursuit of that. So um, in my own journey of thinking that I was even capable of stepping into something like that, uh, that's that's been a long process because I started out uh, not very confident, uh, you know, a, a farmer's son in a small rural village, you know, in Australia, and uh, to to actually think that I could be one of the big boys, that I could actually have an influence, that certainly didn't come naturally. So uh, it's it's been a long, a long and amazing journey. Yeah, I can well imagine, Jamin, you know, all of us, you know, we all start from humble beginnings and, and your mission is so powerful and you're absolutely right. We see the leaders of the, of the world today and we, got, we have to scratch our heads and wonder just how insecure these individuals are from everything that's happening in, in, in Russia and, you know, in the Ukraine and around the world. It's just been totally unbelievable. And, and I don't think I would ever have thought I would see this in my lifetime, let alone in any lifetime. And we would have thought that maybe after the two world wars that this would be this type of stuff would be done, but we still seem to have insecure leaders. And so do you think it's really possible then for us to live free from insecurity or is this something that's just going to be part of what our daily lives? No, I'm convinced whole with every cell in my body. I'm convinced not only is it possible, uh, it, it is essential. It is our most important adult work to free ourselves from the limiting beliefs that we have formed in our past. And the distinction that I make around the experience of that in our daily life is that it must be possible and it is the goal to be unhindered on this current level of growth, to show up here at your best where it matters most. And if and when you do that, the interesting thing is that will naturally lead you into new levels of growth and therefore new levels of uncertainty. And as you grow and experience things you've never done before, you will bump your head on the next level of insecurity. You will, you will go, well, I, I'm good enough for that, but am I good enough for this? You know, I could earn that much money, but am I good enough to earn that much money? I could work with this kind of person, but am I good enough to work with that kind of person? And so the same seven practices that, that overcame insecurity at the last level of growth will be just as effective at the next level of growth. But your initial question, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It yeah. is possible and desirable and necessary to live without insecurity. Absolutely. And I, and I like how you, how you frame that about how we can get comfortable and then our insecurities start to creep in as we start to expand and grow as individuals. And I think that's really part of, that's why I always ask my guests about their hero's quest, because all of us had, have, had, have had those experiences and you wouldn't be doing what you're doing today had you not been challenged and fa- had to face insecurity in whatever shape or form that it showed up for you in order to take that next level. And uh, because you did, the work you're doing today is so profound. So you'd already touched on a little bit of, about talking about li- limiting beliefs, but is that really where our insecurities come from or is there another place or how else would in- uh, insecurity arise for us? Yeah, so, so let, me, let me answer that question by describing the human condition or as I understand the, the human condition. I think the simplest way I could present it is this. We want to be good. We want to feel we are decent human beings. We want others to think we're decent human beings, but we're actually afraid that that's not true, that if we were to fully show up and be exposed who we really are, then there would be inadequacies. There would be shortcomings. There would be um, deficiencies with our character. So we want to be good, but we're actually afraid that we're bad. And for fear of that badness ever being exposed, we either run or we hide. So some people embark on these heroic quests to prove that they are good by what they can do and achieve and perform. Others uh, hide so that they could they 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 survive in safe pockets of the world where they never extend themselves. So no one's looking at them anyway. So they're never going to get exposed. But this insecurity that we are bad, it's all based on these experiences we have in the past, often when we're very young, Mm. and the sense we make of those. Uh, and how interpretation of those and what we think they mean about us and those limiting beliefs uh, are established there. We think, well, this happened because 
I'm no good or I'm not worthy or I don't belong. And I think that's true. And so, yeah, in, insecurity is just this fear of being found out as inadequate. And that's the, the, deep, um, the deep fear that you think is true about you. Uh, and it shows up in all kinds of uh, dysfunctional ways. And if you don't resolve it, it ends up leading to madness. It really yeah. weakens the human being to the point of madness, as we see in the world today. Yeah, great, great point. And it's so true, right? And, then, and it does start at such a young age for us. And, this, and then it's the meanings, the meaning that we start putting around these things, these, these experiences, and we take them with us, like they come with us forward. And unless we're prepared to do that, that hero's work of really doing that inner work and, and revealing those uh, insecurities within us that we're going to struggle in life. We're going to carry that burden, that weight forward. So you talked about children. So can we really prevent our, do, do prevent our children from feeling insecure or how do we protect them? Maybe it would be a better way of, of mm -hmm. uh, protect them from developing insecurities. Uh, I get asked this question all the time and it's an important one because obviously we want to, you know, present our children mature and capable and resilient for the world. Um, but even perfect parents cannot prevent their children establishing limiting beliefs, which is an amazing thing to realize. Uh, and the more you think about it, uh, nor would you want to. So I, I love thinking about the gifts life present to us and some of the paradoxical ways those gifts are presented. So the gift of resistance is so that we become strong. You go into the gym and you lift heavy things. You don't lift air. You go find something to resist your muscles and, and those muscles are broken down and rebuilt. And so no child escapes their childhood without picking up woundedness, without misinterpreting, misunderstanding events and personalizing them. Um, even perfect parents can't prevent their children not getting picked in the soccer team or not getting an A on that, on that test or not being a part of a, a certain group of friends stuff's going to happen. Uh, and the fact that there's woundedness there, that is, that is what gives the adult a chance to be mature, to go back and bring healing to your own self. That's the testing ground. That's the proving ground. That's the strengthening ground. So, um, so I think back to the parenting thing, then if you can't prevent your children from establishing limiting beliefs, then your sole role is to model to them what it looks like to overcome them when the time is right, <laughs> to show them that you don't have to get stuck in a story, that you can change, you can update, you can reinvent, you can heal, uh, you can go back and reinterpret the past and set yourself free. Love that. Absolutely love that. Love that. And we can do that for ourselves as well, right? As you were saying. And we have to do that just, for ourselves. Not yeah. just for our children, but for ourselves and reparent, reparent ourselves. I love that term that you're using there. So how do we overcome insecurity for good? Like, how do we finally just get over that through it? And is that something that's even possible? I think it did kind of answer that in the first question, but how do we get it over it like for good and finally say the insecurity, you're behind me now? Yeah, sure. So uh, when I discovered insecurity in my life for the first time, I'd, I'd been a church pastor for 10 years and uh, got introduced to the coaching skill set and was so astounded by the power and the the effectiveness of this skill set that I had to learn it. And so it resonated so deeply. I felt a stronger sense of call into the coaching space than the pastoring space. But pastoring was all I'd known. I'd grown up in that safe Christian world. I was good in that space. I, I was secure there, but I stepped beyond that into the unknown. And I was so excited by the potential that it, I, I went, yeah, I could do this. And I put my mind to actually writing my first book, told my wife and my best friend I was going to do that and, and went home to my hotel room where I was staying at the time, wrote the first chapter of the first book and was so excited and passionate and energized. And then literally as I shut the lid on that laptop, all that energy went to fear and dread and, oh no, what have I done? I put myself out there. What if I'm no good? What if I can't? What if no one cares? What if this doesn't work? And so that was a very pivotal moment in my life because it was traumatic. It, it terrorized me, this monster of fear inside me. And, and I thought, I've only got two choices here. Either I face this thing um, or I run away from it. And if I run, then I'll, I will shrink back to what's safe, known and comfortable, and I'll never be the man I could be. So I decided to face it. And, and that began a journey of discovering who else had faced this in their life and what could I learn from them. And I discovered in that journey that there were seven things, that there were seven practices that anyone who'd ever effectively overcome an insecurity 
had practiced seven things, whether they were aware of it or not, um, in every case. And so I, I thought this is extraordinary because if I can practice these seven things, then it worked for them, it'll work for me. And if it worked for me, it can work for you. So firstly, it was to understand these seven for myself and then to model it and to refine that process so that I could be useful to others and show them a path that was not about me and not that not something I had invented, but something that I had described and, and modeled. So, uh, yeah, so, that, so to answer your question, you know, how, well, I think the how is, is these seven practices. Nice. And be, beginning with practice one is step into the light and and specifically that that is about uh, to see what it is that you're dealing with. A lot of the time when when I hear people talk about fear and insecurity, they 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 leave it at a level of abstraction that means they can never grasp it. It's always just this thing, this magic force that afflicts them, they can't really see and touch and change. And so stepping into the light is to go, it, you can get clearer than that. And, and if you're going to fight this thing, you will need to see exactly what you're dealing with. Yeah. And so um, the beautiful thing is that the more you examine insecurity and the more precise you get around what it actually is, yeah. you realize it's not, it's not the fear of failure. It's not the imposter syndrome. It's not the fear of rejection. It's much more personal than that. It's if you were to fail, what does that say about you? Uh, it, it, it says you are a failure, <laughs> like it's now, a def it defines you, it's identity. And if you were to be rejected, what does that say about you? Well, it says that you don't deserve love. And so you're actually most afraid of what you think about you, not what anyone else thinks about you. It, it's your own opinions of yourself that you are afraid of. That, that is insecurity. Mm. It's an opinion problem. And, and even more precisely, it's, it's an opinion formed as a child. So all you're dealing with is the opinion of a scared child in a moment of crisis, disappointment, pain, who made some assumptions about what was happening in, in the world and what it meant about you and then developed some certainty around that and some evidence that it was true and then created a narrative and your life has then been lived out of that blueprint. So all we're dealing with, the insecurity, it's not this big out there monster, it's just the opinion of a scared child. And that's incredible because that is a solvable problem. Yeah. <laughs> Opinions are the lowest form of knowing anything. So therefore the easiest thing to change when you get eyes on the problem, then, then you're in the game. Love it. Love it. And that's, I was, thank you for getting into your seven steps. I really wanted to touch base a little bit on them today and really get unpack those, uh, those steps. So please continue on. What would be step two then or the second step in, right. the, in your process? So when you realize that you're dealing with the opinion of a scared child, um, then the natural tendency is to go, oh, yeah, I know why that child formed that opinion because, you know, because of what happened to that child, because of what was said to that child, because of the things that weren't said or the things that happened. So it's very easy to position yourself as a victim when you review the past and then, then you're no better off because you're like, well, it is what it is. I can't change the past. Those things did happen or didn't happen or were said or weren't said. So there's, I can't do anything. Um, but practice two is 100% responsibility. And specifically what that means is to realize the nature of being a human being is that we are sense-making creatures. We are storytellers. So no one has the power to bless us or curse us without our permission. You know, as Don Miguel Ruiz so beautifully said in the four agreements, it's not the words spoken to us that ruin our lives, just the ones we agree with. <laughs> and so we're not the actor in the story we're the storyteller we've, we've got the pen yeah. we've we've always had the pen so when you realize that no one created insecurity for you then you realize that no one's going to save it and change it for you you created this mess and you're the only one who can change it so this idea of responsibility positions you with all the power positions you as the one who can change this and so Blame and excuse is fun, it's easy, it's safe, it's familiar, but it gives you no power to change anything. Uh, all change comes from responsibility. So that's that's practice too. Yeah. Right on. Perfect. Perfect. So what are some of the biggest impacts of personal insecurity that we're having in the world today? And we touched a little bit in the start, but tell me a couple of what you're thinking is the biggest impact that we're seeing today in the world. Well, well, madness is sounds like a pretty dramatic word, but I think it is 
the apt word to describe the impact of unresolved insecurity. Because when a person is insecure, um, all their best energy is directed towards proving themselves and defending themselves uh, at all costs because they can't afford to show up as they are and be revealed because if they were exposed, they would be, they would be found out as no good. And so a person with insecurity can't apologize. They can't take a backward step. They can never be seen to be doing anything wrong because then it reveals that they are wrong. So there's an, there's an irrational way of living as an insecure person that descend, it's, it's, it is a descent into madness. It's an inherently good person who consistently behaves in ways that are against their own being and against others. It, it perpetuates evil in the world. It, it takes, it, it steals, it vilifies, it, it attacks. So it's, it's quite catastrophic. Mm. Um, I think... If you want to go a bit more micro and understand the impact of the individual, yeah. it, it impacts you know, your, your health. Uh, I think, you know, um, where you are insecure, you are whole, your whole being is designed to protect yourself. So that can often show up in extra weight in patterns of sickness because it all pulls you back from ever fully showing up. At relationships, it, it creates neediness. And that is the weakest way you can position yourself in a relationship. If you go in needing someone to love you and believe in you so you can feel good about yourself, you suck them dry. Like, yeah. Because even when they do give it to you, you doubt it because you've never, you've never found an internal way of referencing your own value and worth anyway. Um, finances, a person's relationship with money is one of the clearest windows into their relationship with themselves. And so you watch people struggle with lack and limit and uh, and poverty all because they don't believe they deserve um, they will get stuck living separate from their purpose because they don't think they're good enough to have a purpose so they end up serving someone else's purpose for the rest of their life you know it, it shows up in all kinds of painful ways and um, and ultimately is pretty catastrophic for the planet yeah, absolutely. Totally agree with that. And love the how you've positioned it around these different aspects of our life. And it's so true about how, how we're, we our belief systems around money and relationships and how we find love and what is love. And when we struggle with that, we definitely, it does definitely reveals how some insecurities that we may have. So how do you go about changing beliefs about yourself? Like what was the process that you went through to change the beliefs in sure. yourself so when you're teaching others? Yeah, sure. So I think that when you kind of get eyes on what the problem is, my own opinion of myself and the realization that I formed that opinion, I think the the brilliance of the that what that makes possible. Like I love talking about misdirection and, and understanding the power of misdirection. Um, you know, it's a magician's only trick. If they can have you convinced that all the action's taking place in the left hand, then you're paying all your attention there. They could be doing anything with their right hand, but you're not watching that. So a trick happens, you didn't see it, and it seemed supernatural to you. That's often, you know, that was my experience of my past. It felt like stuff happened to me that I didn't have any control over, that either blessed me or cursed me, and I couldn't change it, and it's magic, and it's outside my ability to influence. But when I got eyes on the real problem and I realised, no, 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 all the action took place in my own being. I controlled the action. I was the one agreeing disagreeing forming assumptions and opinions that was game changing because it just meant i now had the ability to change it because if i wrote the first story well then i know how to tell stories i've been telling stories my whole life yeah. i could go back and and update that um so i think then then the game changing piece of information too was to go back and actually re-experience it through the child's eyes rather than trying to rescue myself from a distance. Sometimes I watch people do this. I, I see them kind of go, oh, yeah, there was some stuff for the child. Oh, yeah, you know, you'll be all right. Don't worry about it. Let's just move on. And um, it wasn't about you, so stop thinking it was. And now just be happy. And it's like the child's like, yeah, but I was there and I experienced it and I did feel like it was about me. So I'm unconvinced. So I think the real game changer is to actually go back and validate that child's experience. Um, you know, for instance, I was coaching someone recently who, uh, you know, going back to a key defining moment in their life, um, they remember being six years old and uh, desperately wanting a, a new bike for Christmas because all the, all the boys in their street got bikes 
sometime throughout that year, either their birthday or a grandparent gave them on or whatever. They got bikes. And so they were the cool kids and they were always riding after school. And this kid didn't have a bike and so couldn't fit in. And so begged his parents for a bike for Christmas, thought he'd pitched it well enough that it was guaranteed he was getting a bike. So had already planned in his mind how the world's going to change, how awesome it's going to be. I'm going to get a bike. I'm going to fit in. I'm going to be cool. It's all going to be okay. And of course, Christmas came and he didn't get a bike. He got a fishing pole instead. And it just was such a catastrophic experience for him because he'd been so invested in what would become possible when he had that bike. And so that changed his life. You know, so you could go back and look at that as an adult and go, oh, it's just a kid who didn't get a bike. You, you'll be all right, son. You know, stuff happens. You'll be, you'll be fine. Stop worrying about it. It was just a bike. But for that kid, it wasn't just a bike. It was absolutely everything. And, and when he didn't get it, the, the flow on of catastrophe through his whole being changed his life. And from that moment, he never hoped the same again. He never dreamed the same again. He, he assumed that he just he would never fit in, that his parents clearly didn't love him because there was some problem with him. So, so that's been, that was such a massive issue for him and he would never have seen it as an adult because you wouldn't be looking for stuff like that. You'd be looking for big stuff, yeah. abuse or, you know, severe bullying or something like that. But he is a kid not getting a bike. Um, so I think the game changer is the healing process that comes by actually going back and validating that little boy's experience and go, I get it. I, I could see how you thought that meant everything about you. I could see how terrible that was for you that moment. But what you couldn't see is that your parents didn't understand your pitch. You thought you were being really clear. Um, they didn't understand how badly you wanted this bike. They thought that you didn't really care that much and actually liked fishing. They, there was a misunderstanding. Yeah. Um, and also, you didn't see that they were really struggling financially at the time and they couldn't have afforded the bike anyway. It had nothing to do with you. They loved you. They wanted you to be happy. They, they adored you, but you couldn't see all that data Um if you can see that now, that does change things. It does free you from this assumption that that meant something about you. Um, so that whole experience in my own life of going back and reviewing the, the key moments, the defining moments, not from a distance, but actually getting in the midst of it, re-experiencing it, but then bringing more data back in there um, to reframe that experience for the child and, um, and, and in a way heal myself. So that's that's how I think that's that's the central part of the the how beliefs get changed by bringing new data back to those experiences. Yeah, I, and totally, I totally love that. And I was just, man, we just had uh, we just had a little mi a mini coaching session on the on the podcast here today <laughs> because I was thinking back as uh, you know in in my youth in uh, as I was doing some some of my own uh, inner child work in my youth, I can remember losing in the, in the provincial finals for my high school basketball team. And, uh, it were this, like this close to winning it all, but we lost. Right. And I can remember carrying that loss like devastatingly and how it held me back. And I always felt that, you know, I'm in, I'm only good enough for second place. And so I would, I could, I can think back about how reserved I would be about pushing too hard, you know, push, 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 and then be that, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to win anyways. I'm not going to finish. And I'm mm -hmm. listening to you tell that story. And that's exactly the type of thing that happens for how many of us to go back and we think about something like that. And now what I didn't, what, you know, what I didn't understand back then is that this, that particular school has never prior or since ever been that far ever. Mm -hmm. So it was a great time of uh, life for me as well as for, for that school. And so the experience of being able to be in that tough position is really the piece that's this is the growth part of it. Instead of looking at it as a pass fail situation as a, instead now re, reframing it and looking at it as a growth opportunity and the, and how it, how that had, could have shaped and changed things. And so I'm listening to that. You tell that story and it's going, wow, wow that's just, that's just outstanding. Like, you know, how it's easily we can take an insecurity well, it's unavoidable. Every one of us have got these moments where things didn't yeah. work out the way we want. And we're sense-making creatures, always asking and answering two questions for every experience. Question one, why did that happen? Question two, what does it mean about me? 
Mm-hmm. And when we're young with limited emotional intelligence, limited maturity, we are often answering those questions negatively and personally. Yeah, absolutely. Love those two. So, that and is so it, go people ahead. go, like people ask me all the time as a coach, they're like, you know, you're a coach. This is about results, about moving forward. Surely we don't have to go back into the past. And I go, oh, no, I never take people back into the past except, except where it's necessary. Uh, and by the way, it's always necessary. So, yes, we're going back. Of course, we're going back. We've got to go back. There's a wounded child there. In every case, there's a wounded child who's still running the show, who's still living out of those assumptions formed in, in difficult moments. And so, <laughs> like, of course, you've got to go back. You've got to help that child. You've got to, in an act of kindness and compassion, go back and give that child more resources, bring yeah. some new data back to that child. And, and you can actually change that child's experience because new data makes old data obsolete. Mm. I, I used to think a, a cycling track, a round cycling track was called a melodrome. And in my mind, it was a melodrome. I, I thought, yep, it's a melodrome. And then someone said, what are you saying? Melodrome? It's, it's a velodrome. I'm like, no, it's not. And then they showed me the word written. And I'm like, oh, no, that's clearly I was wrong. So that new data changed my experience of that word. And even though I was embarrassed and it was a bit weird, I could never call it a melodrome again. Yeah. I didn't have to try and convince myself to say velodrome. It's like clearly that data shows me something different. And so to go back and bring healing to your child, it's not like you've got to go back and back a thousand times to constantly have the conversation. Go back and do it properly. Go back and bring healing. Go back and bring the data. Go back and validate their experience and then coach them out of that experience give them a broader, bigger map of the world to live out of. Uh, and so that's, that's the, the beautiful process when done well. That brings transformation and sets a person free from their limiting beliefs. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, in your work, uh, a lot of my work is, to, is uh, focused on, do, on helping men live and find their life purpose. And so do you finding that, that men struggle with this, doing this kind of work more so? Than, than your than your female co- coaching clients or do you, is it is it about the same? Uh, I would say I probably coach sixty percent women, yeah. um, and so as a generalization, I think men are a little more reluctant to reach out for help. I think men are a little more backward in terms of expressing their emotions and and self awareness. So I think the challenge of doing this seems like it is slightly greater for men as a generalization. Um, but, yeah, but a, a beautiful thing when a, when a man faces their fear and mm-hmm. says yes to a hero's journey a moment and goes, I've got to, I've got to go back and review this because if I don't, I'll never get what I want. I'll never live the life that I desire. I'll be limited and bound up um, by what has happened in my past. So I must. Yeah, absolutely. I want to touch a little bit on and talk a little bit about social media. There's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it seems like a constant uh, every day. And even I have to fight myself off from, you know, getting, uh, you know, getting up and, you know, have my little morning routine and then, you know, okay, got to check my Instagram feed and Facebook feed and, and then question, why are we, why am I doing that? Are you finding that social media, is that, is that helping or hurting the insecurity problem? Hmm. Well, I think, it, it just speeds up the rate of feedback. I think that's the issue with social media. So people have always been just as insecure, but, you know, 30, 40 years ago, you would do something and the, the amount of time between when you did something, when you got feedback around how that was received could, could be days. <laughs> now you do something and you have instant feedback around whether people like it, whether they don't like it, whether they comment. And so it just exacerbates the insecurity problem. And, and I think... Uh, culturally, most people will never find a way of swapping external validation for internal. And so culturally, you're almost rewarded for external validation. It's like if you do things that others like, you get a, a like, you get kudos, you get feedback, you get comments, you get celebrated. So it kind of seems like that's the way you feel good about yourself. You do more external stuff, better external stuff, flashier, bigger, better, brighter. That's how you feel good as a human being. And so I think that cultural tendency to place all your validation needs in the responsibility of the world is what social media plays into. So it's, it's dangerous and destructive because you just make yourself so vulnerable. If, if you don't get what you need from the world, then you're in deficit. 
and it's it's catastrophic internally so um, yeah and if uh, and, and unless you have uh, a million followers and they all and they all love every little thing that you do you know we're going to be in a deficit more often than not i totally agree with you and i think it's exactly right because you might just have one person not like you and that's it oh that's oh, now i'm no good now i've got to scrap that and, and start again so yeah it, it's it's very a very vulnerable place to live out of yeah, absolutely. Because you're living totally externally, right? We're not totally even, externally. Yeah, we're not. We're right. not looking at anything internally. So, listen. Of everything that we've talked about today, and maybe there's something we haven't yet talked about. What would be one thing that you would to have? Uh, you would leave our listeners with for a takeaway. Mm-hmm. Well, let's go back to where we started with the hero's journey. Um, practice five in my model is to get help from someone who doesn't care about you. So, I I love the the metaphor of the hero's journey of that the hero always needs a guide there's a wisdom character there's a gandalf there's a yoda there's a dumbledore there's a mr miyagi so at times we need help and and i think insecurity is one of those times because you've gathered so much evidence that you think a certain way and it's true it's concrete it's real you're not making this up so to get out of your own head to get out of your own story and to see things more clearly you will need someone outside of your experience Mm. so i love the distinction of get help from someone who doesn't care about you because it's counterintuitive you think you're going to need someone who believes in you who supports you who encourages you who's going to pump your tires up when they're flat and that that person's actually going to get in the way because they'll confuse you about who the hero is in this story you'll think they're the hero you'll think they're there to rescue you but in the hero's quest there is a guide and they are there for a short time, but they're always gone too soon. And the hero is still left to face the dragon alone. So, so the last thing I'd say is find someone who can hold a clean space for you, who, who is secure enough not to need to rescue you or to uh, have to encourage you, but can help you be objective about your own story, can help you review the data of your life and, examine the narratives that you have held to be true to see the holes in them to see the gaps and then to see where they don't even make sense because they never make sense people are terrified of doing the review work and going back and analyzing the data in case they find it's true but but it's never true not once is it true because it's written by a child a child doesn't have access to objectivity they're a child making stuff up trying to cope with a difficult adult world so even the best stories told by children are still not true Mm -hmm. so (laughs) <laughs> the value of finding someone who can hold a space for you um, and, and bring some certainty that it's possible because they've gone on their own hero's journey. So yeah. they're bringing embodied wisdom, wisdom. I think that is, well, I mean, it makes the list of the seven essential practices that that is practice five. So I think that's a really important distinction to, to uh, add to this conversation. Outstanding. I just love that, Jamie. What a way to, to sum up our, our conversation today. I want to thank you for spending time with me today. And you've shared such great insight on what it, what it means to have be insecure and how we can look to overcome it and really allow ourselves to grow and do that hero's quest work. So if someone wanted to get a hold of you and, and participate in one of your programs and come to work and do some work with you, how would they go about doing that? Yeah, I mean, you can search the Insecurity Project. Um, you'll find my podcast. You'll, you'll find my books and my, my website, my socials. Um, or if you can work out how to spell my name, Jamin Fraser, uh, then, then I'm easy to find too. There's only one Jamin Fraser in the world, as far as I can tell. Uh, and and uh, yeah, you, you'll, you'll easily find me. Right on. Well, I'll make sure I put your website, your social links, everything they can do, we can do to have, give uh, people opportunity to reach out with you and do some work with you. I wanted to say thank you so much for spending time with, with me today. It was an outstanding conversation. Thanks so much for, for having me, Alan. It was very enjoyable. Thank you for listening to the Revolutionary Man podcast. Are you ready to own your destiny? To become more the man you are destined to be? Join the brotherhood that is The Awakened Man at theawakenedman.net and start forging a new destiny today.